So first of all, a little bit of my face to say hello to everyone and thank you for joining us today. I'm right now in one of the most intense and very, very speaking areas of Venice. I'm in a campiello called Delle Scuole and I will start my tour here. I hope that you will all enjoy and I like questions, although I know we have a lot of people joining. So. I hope that uh, I will be able to answer questions while we tour around. Where am, I, where am I? So I highlight to you the place name. It's called the Campiello delle Scuole. It means uh, that we are in the square of the synagogues. Now, in the northern parts of Venice called the Canareggio, there's a canal not too far from here called Canal di Canareggio, which was originally used in the past times to deliver goods, merchandise from northern Europe to the center of Venice, the Grand Canal. More or less, I show you now the way to reach this canal. It's down this alleyway at the very end. Imagine this major street in water, of course, of Venice that was used by Hungarians, Polish, Flemish, Austrians, mer merchants, all coming from Northern Europe, who brought to Venice silver, copper, uh, Flemish wool, and left with uh, spices, with silk, uh, a lot of sugar as well. So originally, this part of Venice, which is not very central, was used to uh, basically cast metal, to create metal foundries. And the area was foundry, this very one where I am, till at the beginning of the 1400s. It was uh, therefore a very unhealthy place full of um, unhealthy air and uh, for sure that's also explaining to you why never a church was designed in this district of Venice. Too much industrial, so not exactly um, near some residential near some residential areas. By the beginning of the 1400s, however, Venice got involved as a city-state in a major military, com military campaign, implying uh, a higher investment in uh, weapons, and the metal foundry that used to be here was uh, closed to be moved to the Arsenale area, which is uh, in the northern eastern part of uh, the city. So in the area where I am till the beginning of the 1500s, Basically, you would still have some uh, remains of the metal foundry and uh, some people, very poor, decided to live here. Till uh, 1516, uh, when uh, in a part of uh, uh, this area I will show you later, the first Jews were allowed to move in the city. I will explain later on why Jews would live here, but for those, for those of you that do not know, it seems that the word ghetto was born here in Venice, a contribution to the language of discrimination. The word originally for metal found was getto, G-E-D-G-E-T-T-O, and the first Jews that moved here speaking German, would uh, therefore pronounce the word getto with a guttural g, so ghetto instead of getto. And in 1542, this area became the area for the Sephardic Jews. So what I'm showing you is the street where Sephardic Jews moved in and what the synagogues we see around would be for, for those uh, that came from uh, originally the Iberian Peninsula. So here you can see the Sephardic uh, synagogue used uh, in the summertime by our current community called the Ponentina, so the one where the sun sets, uh, speaking of Spanish and Portuguese Jews that left, as you know, the Iberian Peninsula already by 1492 and 1497, and then eventually reached Venice by 1542 to settle here. 
The synagogue is particularly rich inside. Uh, I invite the ones that have not been to Venice when uh, they come uh, to inquire about visiting. Usually this is possible to visit in the time when it's not used by the community, so during the, the winter time. And you see there are four large windows up there, that's for the main hall. And up there you can see some small windows that originally were the windows for the women's section. As you know, in, uh, in Italy we don't have reformed Jews, so when the service takes place, women will participate separate from the men behind the some screens but using the main the main room this is a very important building one passing by cannot ignore cannot think it can be something else like a private home i mean from the outside it's pretty clear that this is not a private place but it's a monumental element it was here when in december the 7th in 1947 the community decided to place an inscription reminding of what happened during world war ii and also before during the racial laws this is um, one of the three memorials we find in the ghetto reminding us of the Shoah that it says 1939, 1945, 200 Jews from Venice, 8,000 Jews from Italy, 6 million of Jews from Europe were chased, martyred and suppressed by hatred, um, blind hatred, blind barbarian hatreds in far off countries. So it's um, a very, as I said, a very important inscription placed on the facade of the Ponentina Synagogue in 1947, right after World War II. I like also showing the entrance of the synagogue, which is particularly Baroque. In Venice, we have uh, monuments uh, that date back uh, to the time of the Doge's Republic until 1797 in different uh, styles. Now, please don't forget, uh, Jews in Venice were not allowed to be artists. Uh, so this is the result of uh, Christian artisans who were asked to make a beautiful door by this, firm, this Spanish and Portuguese speaking community of Jews. I'll show you some details, maybe floral, and also some here. This is all in wood. And then you have also uh, the original key lock and some more details here. Um, on the other side, as I said, we are in the Campiello of the main synagogues, the ones the community uses currently. On the opposite side, you have the so-called Levantina Synagogue. And this uh, was uh, designed instead for all the Jews that came to Venice from the Ottoman Empire. Uh, in particular, we know from Salonico, from Istanbul, and they were also speaking Turkish, they were speaking Greek. This is one of the characteristics of the ghetto in Venice. It was multilingual and multi-religious, uh, if you like, as we had a section for the Sephardic and a section for the Ashkenazi Jews. And um, I calculated that more or less we had at least nine languages spoken in this area. So Spanish, Portuguese, Greek, Turkish, French, Italian, meaning Roman, and then we had also German. So don't forget also Yiddish and Hebrew. So we had a really very wide variety. And on this synagogue, again, we find the four windows sign, the women's section here. And I would like to show another inscription, which was placed in 1923. For those of you that remember our history, Italian history, you know that Mussolini got his uh, power in Italy by the 28th of October in 1922. And just one month later, the community of Jews in Venice asked the city council to place a memorial to remember those Jews that died. They were all from Venice, 
during World War I for the city of, for the Italian, for the Italian state. Um, one month after Mussolini got his power, the community asked, in March 1923, the inscription was placed here. And it says in Italian, the Venetian Jews that fell in war for the country, the community remembers with love and pride. For those of you that read Hebrew, you will enjoy the fact that the Hebrew doesn't sound, doesn't translate exactly what the Italian says. It talks about brave men, heroes whose memory should not uh, um, perish from generation from, to generation. So there should be a memory of uh, these heroes. I find it very interesting that the Hebrew does not say what the Italian says. And um, well, we are already in time of fascism. And you see the names of those that died for the country. And right opposite, isn't that shocking in a way? Let me turn around. You see the inscription I showed you before, where instead the sign of the fact that in uh, 1943 already Jews were considered foreign enemies in a foreign country. Mm. So uh, on one side we have the heroes, on the other side we have the enemies to get rid of. When were these uh, synagogues designed? Well, we know that the Sephardic uh, community started settling in the city in the middle of the 1500s. I would say by 1590, their presence was uh, more or less uh, quite uh, permanent. Although when we talk about the Sephardic Jews uh, in Venice, I must uh, say that there's always been a constant uh, dynamic movement. Uh, so not all Sephardic Jews that moved to Venice would uh, do it uh, to stay here permanently. Although would they know how long, who would they, how would, would they be able to tell how long they were allowed in the city? In the meanwhile, I want to show you, however, how the community clearly was growing. Originally, I told you about just um, some people living here, whereas um, by the end of the 1500s, the community had grown up to 3,000 for sure. And the steps, and you can see, floors, uh, um, stories were added one on top of the other as the community grew. In fact, while uh, the Jewish community grew bigger and bigger, the area where they could live did not expand at all. So the only way to expand the um, living quarters in the ghetto was to move vertically towards uh, higher and higher so that the city view from up there of course no elevators still today would uh, allow Jews to see the city but at the same time they were not allowed to live anywhere else in uh, in Venice. Now I'm uh, moving this way I, I asked Danny and Julie and everybody helping with the organization to let me know if uh, the quality of the signal keeps uh, being good enough and also if my voice sound is fine. Thank you for just confirming or telling me, no, we haven't heard anything. <laughs> you be. sound great, Luisella. Thank you so much for checking in. Thank you for helping. So the Calle del Ghetto Vecchio, this is where we are right now, so the street of the old ghetto. Do not forget, please, that the word ghetto meant metal foundry is what we are looking at right now. And the, the steps will climb in a few minutes, a bridge will bring us to the oldest part of the ghetto. To the oldest part means the one where the first Jews moved in, that was in 15. 16. Um, before we move there, just one more memorial that was placed on the 7th of December in 1947. This is reminding of the rabbi of the community in uh, 1944 when uh, the um, when the 
well, 1943 is the time when the first roundup was arranged by Nazi fascist forces. It was the 5th of December in 1943. And uh, Adolfo Ottolenghi happened to be the chief rabbi already by 1919. He was originally from Tuscany, from Livorno. And this is an inscription placed uh, uh, right on the front of a house uh, that was not used as a home, but was the school that Adolfo Ottolenghi founded already by the 1930s in, uh, in the ghetto. Um, it's a place which, of course, uh, gets remembered, that you, as you can see here, the dry reef with the City Council of Venice that remembers what happened. Adolfo Ottolenghi stayed with his community and was arrested to be taken to Auschwitz, where he never came back from. So now we cross the bridge. We cross the bridge and we get to the oldest part of the ghetto. Um, you can read here Parrocchia di Santa Luisa, so the parish of uh, Santa Luisa, Ponte del Ghetto Vecchio, so the bridge of uh, the old ghetto, and Campo del Ghetto Nuovo. So paradoxically, the new ghetto is in fact a reference to the oldest part of the Jewish area in Venice. This is the square we'll explore in a minute. Let me show you, however, the canal. The canal is a canal that keeps on running, turns around here, goes all the way. So this very square, the oldest the part of a ghetto, is an island with a sort of an oval circular form. And around it, there's a canal, which made it perfect for a metal foundry to prevent fires from destroying the rest of the city. Now, when... Uh, Jews moved in, which was in December, sorry, in, uh, in March the 29th, uh, in 1516. Imagine two story high buildings, um, a community of 100 Venetian Christians used to live here before. They were chased away very easily when the state of Venice decided that only Jews would live in this area, then landlords were told, when Jews move in, you are allowed to raise your rent by 30%. So this brought all the Christians that lived here to live very quickly and to let the Jewish community move in. At that time, we are not talking about more than 100 Jews. They had moved to Venice in a rush. As um, just a few years before, a major war was lost by the city of Venice. Its uh, military campaign to conquer the northern Italian peninsula had brought a higher and higher tension. And by 1508, the papacy arranged a league signing it in Cambrai together with uh, Spain and Austria, with uh, France, with Milan, with uh, basically all the countries in Europe, all against Venice. The army of the Venetian state was defeated in 1509 near Milan and refugees uh, started moving quickly away all the way to Venice, all the way from Milan, from the northern parts of Italy, as Venice prom promised safety. And in that group of refugees, there would be also Jews who the city of Venice allowed to stay as, of course, their capital was of interest to the Venetian state. After the war was over, and the solution was found, which actually was pretty positive for the city of Venice. Then in 1516, in the Senate, Zaccaria Dolphin proposed the idea of the ghetto. Venice had been a very strongly multi-ethnic city from the very start, 
it was a city welcoming foreigners also because there was a strong trading um, uh, economy that needed the presence of foreign communities and also because of the position of Venice, a sort of a place in between the East and the West where everybody coming from Northern Europe could get the status of symbols coming from exotic far off countries such as North Africa, the Middle East and uh, the Far East. And of course, uh, uh, where you could also bring any goods coming from Northern Europe. But this was the first time a community was asked to live in a specific area just by themselves. The gates, uh, I show you one area where the gates used to be, were also placed. So this was the first time, uh, let's say, the word ghetto was used. It was the first time when uh, a state planned a segregation, physical and not just uh, uh, spiritual in a way. Um, the gates would be closed when the sun set. I'm showing you now where they used to be. So we are entering an area maybe where the signal is not too good. I'm doing my best. And you keep on telling me, please, if it works or not. Okay. So far, so, so good. For, great. So we have reached now the area where the canal runs. And by this very door, before the bridge, we see on the sides still the sign of where the gates latch would be. Now this has been filled up, but if I move down this way, you still see right now where the latch would go. From mid so let's say the, the, the document mentioned from midnight till dawn. To be precise, uh, for the city of Venice, midnight corresponded to sunset. So we know when darkness arrived, then uh, Christian soldiers locked the gates. The gates were locked from within. And those Christian guards were paid by the community, the Jewish community, to make sure that they were doing their job. Now, just around the canal right here, there would be constantly during the night time a patrol on boats moving all around to make sure that nobody was trying to leave the ghetto during the night hours and to make sure that nobody was trying to get in. So paradoxically, the gates were protecting the community from plundering and night violence. The parish is Sant'Alvise and below it says Ponte del Ghetto Nuovo, the bridge of the new ghetto. I just want to show you on the other side, uh, Parrocchia the San Marcuola, so it's a parish of San Marcuola. So there are two parishes. And I was reading also that they did not agree on whom had to design a church. So when this became a Jewish area, basically it was probably the only island in Venice where no church, no temple, nothing Christian had been designed, designed before. Now the gates were closed from within. And of course, in case of need, you could leave the ghetto. Uh, suppose that there was a fire, suppose that there was some danger. But the important thing about the gates is to understand that they were closing the area during the night hours when the risk of violence was, was higher. And within this area, there would be the different synagogues. Now, I show you the oldest, it's under restoration. Um, the German synagogue opened in 1528. At the side there, we can see some kind of a wooden construction, which belongs to the so-called Canton synagogue. Uh, some say the word Canton comes from the French word Canton de Juif, from Marseille, from South of France. So some say 
this was a French community, and by 1575, here we are. This is the Italian synagogue. And you can notice the windows are five. This is a characteristic of the Ashkenazi synagogue. So five windows like the five books of the Torah. And as you can tell, a difference from the Sephardic. It's uh, quite interesting to imagine that in this area, there would be religious life, but also economic life. So why is it that the Venetian state allowed the Jews to move to Venice and told them to live in an area very peripheral and quite far away from the rest of the town and with the gates on the outside? Well, consider the difficulties, economically speaking, the city of Venice found itself after that war. It was just the end of a series of events, pretty um, uh, unlucky for the city of Venice, uh, the discovery of America, the possibility to circumnavigate Africa, uh, Vasco da Gama reached. Um, the fact that Venice could be easily bypassed, as by then there would be different routes. The war going on, Constantinople becoming Istanbul. So Venice needed excellent moneylenders. Banco Rosso, this is the name of one of the three pawn shops that used to be in the ghetto. Banco Rosso means the Red Bank. Some say that the word red, uh, the other two pawn shops, uh, here we can also see beautiful mezuza, comes from the color of the receipt you were receiving when you got your loans. So imagine the Christian people coming in during the daytime. The gates were, of course, open, coming in and asking for a loan. Bringing here a shaving set, some linen, bringing here white hair to become a wig or to bring an object in, uh, in pewter and asking uh, some uh, cash in exchange. Usually what happened was that you were receiving a part of the value of the object, asking uh, the one receiving the money, come back and bring this much more in uh, such time. This never really happened, uh, or at least happened very rarely. So Jewish moneylenders were left with pawns of small value. They could bring to the area of Rialto, the major trading center in Venice, and arranging an auction, they hoped to get a little bit more than uh, they had lent. So in fact, the money lending activity was uh, keeping them Poor. Consider also that the city of Venice established no Jews are allowed to own property. So if you had money but you could not invest it and only you could do was to lend money at very low interest rates with very high risks, then we can easily talk about poor money, money lenders. Which by the way was not the case of the Sephardic Jews who arriving later were mainly merchants in rich textiles, in uh, goods that were in fact uh, a sign of, of wealth. I just want to go back uh, to the concept of the color of the receipt because uh, um, you know the red receipt, the green receipt, the black receipt helped uh, people find the pawn shop where they got their loans from. What does it mean? It means that the Christians that came here to ask for a loan were most of them for sure illiterate. So the color helped understand what they had to do because they could not, they could not read. Um, now we are by the other side of the canal, so you can see a main canal. The canal runs this way and then surrounds the ghetto in this side. Where I'm right now, it changed a lot uh, by the time when the gates were removed, uh, by, Ju by July the uh, year 1797, by the general Bonaparte, later on Emperor Napoleon, 
this did not exist. So this area is the part, let's say, newer of the, of the ghetto, dates back to 1890. And you have right down there, the elderly home I would like to, to show you. Um, the conditions of Venice gave the Jews were the freedom of faith, the possibility to meet the synagogues were not just a place where they prayed. They were called scuola, which is very similar to shul. In Venice, however, the word scuola meant brotherhood, meant guild, meant a lay place where social assistance could be arranged. So Venice offering Jews freedom of faith, possibility to meet and to associate and to have uh, a community center. The possibility to work, okay, with uh, major limitations. The fact that during the night uh, there would be less of a risk. This meant, uh, in a way, that the ghetto of Venice had uh, that positive aspect which attracted Jews to Venice. So the number originally of 100, eventually developing to 3,000 more, is a sign of the fact that the ghetto had a centripetal force and would not be a ghetto in the way we intend the Warsaw one or the idea of a segregation which took place during World War II. And if you went to the Jewish ghetto in Rome, for instance, you may remember there the ghetto is completely surrounded by churches. And when Jews wanted, uh, wanted to go home, they had to pass by Jesus on the cross. Uh, and some say they put uh, some wax in their ears, not to hear what the priest would say. Venice was exactly the opposite, it was not trying to convert the Jews, also because Venice needed money lenders and not converted, converted Jews. Um, I'm showing you now the rest home, but before I show you the rest home, I would like to show you the very first memorial of the Holocaust. In 1979, an artist from Kaunas, from Lithuania, his name was Arbit Blatash, uh, lived in the Judeca Island for a few months and produced these seven bar reliefs in bronze. Some are very specific, some are more generic regarding the Holocaust. Um, we can see, for instance, the Kristallnacht here. He donated uh, uh, the uh, work you're looking at to the city of Venice, which was placed here in 1980. A very powerful set of bar reliefs and actually if any of you could help me i read that while this is the original we have a replica in front of the office of the un in new york this is uh, forced labor and i would like uh, you to tell me if it's really true if what I read in the internet is really true that we have a replica of this memorial in seven bar reliefs in New York in front of the UN office. This is reminding the Warsaw uprising. You can almost feel the smoke. Up there we have another one. More of an abstract a general idea or the execution in the ghetto. Um, I hope you can get the idea also of the size of comparing with the bricks. And then we have also the final solution. And the deportation. There is not a, a specific, um, how can I say, uh, chronological view of these works. And as I said, they were placed here in 1980. This is the artist's name, Arbit Blatash. 
his father and his mother were deported. As I said, he was from Kauna, also from Lithuania. And in the ghetto, we have also the famous, by now, Stolperstein, although I must admit, uh, not many are familiar with uh, the Stolperstein, uh, these uh, stumbling blocks. Here we have uh, some of uh, on the city of Venice recently placed. Uh, may I show the oldest one? Uh, it was placed, as I remember, in uh, 2004, so let's see. 2014, I'm sorry. So it says uh, from this home were deported 21 elderly guests, eventually assassinated in the Nazi lagers. These are among the strongest uh, memorials because they do um, speak to the younger generation. So when I'm here with my youngest uh, guests, uh, while well, uh, the inscriptions on the walls uh, do tell them something if you explain them. Like this one here, Giuseppe Iona was the president of the Jewish community during uh, those uh, tragic years. And uh, after being summoned by the Nazi officers and asked to come back with the list of uh, the Venetian Jews and where they lived, he decided either to hide it or to destroy it and then to kill himself so that the names and their residence would not be known to Nazis. So let's say that before Second World War, uh, there's a list of uh, Jews and uh, fascist authorities came up with uh, of around 2100, although over 600 declared themselves a Christian Catholic. Some said that they had no religious faith. And in uh, um, between the two rounds up, in December the 5th and in August the 14th, 1943 and 1944, 246 Jews were arrested. And these are the names of the ones that were arrested. This is... Um, let me, sorry, I'm not confused. I just wanted to show you the overall monument so you can see quite a large space in the part of the garden of the elderly home. And then we have a part in bronze and a part on the back in wooden planks, which should remind a train and then the names carved. This is a work in combination between Arbit Blatash and uh, Frank Cassemi. So you can see how it's arranged. You have the name, the last name, and the age when they died. Oh, sure, sure, sure. sure. And I find it very interesting that while the work by Arbit Blatash in bronze it has no face. It gets, uh, in a way, into a tragedy involving the whole humankind. Then the back is instead dedicated to the single people, because we know that the history that history is history of people of single people. And um, being in wood, I think that this also tells how fragile memory can be would deteriorate. So the fact that the names of the ones we have to remember are inscribed in wood explains also the commitment we need to keep when we remember such tragedies. So not just the generic part, but also the single names. Um, I'm almost at the end of this tour. If I have one more minute of your patience, I would like to show you the third area, hoping that this short talk has given you the idea, okay, we have only scratched the surface, as they say, of the complexity of this area that started its life as a military space. Venice was known for its power, military power. Imagine that the Arabic name of Venice means rifle, the gun island. The ghetto was therefore a place where cannons were made. 
And then by 1516, it started being a place where an essential community, essential for the survival, economic survival of the city of Venice, started gathering, getting bigger and bigger, still with uncertainty. Venice allowed the permanently to stay here, but in the end, as who would know how long this permission would, uh, would last. I remember reading the inventories of notaries of the 16th century, and in particular, when a rich Jew died, I remember reading what you would find in his home. You would find a very nice headboard, very expensive a silver, goldware, leather, a beautiful trunk, and then very cheap chairs, very cheap furniture, telling that even the rich merchants of the Sephardi communities were never believing in the fact that they would stay in Venice forever. So never see the point in investing money in furniture, which they could not take along in case from one day to the other, they were told you are no longer allowed to live here. Um, and then I tried to show you also the difference in the synagogues from the outside, the Sephardic and the Ashkenazi showing that in fact the ghetto is not one ghetto. The ghetto is a place of diversity even within the Jewish, the Jewish community. Here we can see, for instance, and that's where uh, the very last part I want to show you, Calle Ghetto Novissimo, this is the entrance to another third area. Uh, still with gates, where more Sephardic families moved to starting in 1633, and they were the richest ones. And their education was very high, and they did not live with the other Sephardic Jews who were not as rich, who were not as well educated. So here you can still see the remains of the, of the gate latches. And then Turning around so you, I hope, can see the way out the ghetto. Um, please don't forget we are right now walking. So very soon I will uh, cross a bridge and show you this house here from the other side. The other side, which is facing the canal, which means I will show you the main facade of this house. Now, as I said, this was a very rich community who moved here in 1633 and were also the first ones to leave the ghetto when the gates were opened. I show you also that they took their mezuzot away. You see the mezuzah missing here. You see also the mezuzah missing here. And one more there. Um, 1633, that's also very important for the history of Venice. What does it mean? Uh, please don't, I don't expect you to remember, but in 1630, 1632, Venice was hit by the worst pandemic event ever, the bubonic plague, who ki which killed one third of the Venetians. And what was the reaction of Venice soon after the pandemic was over? To allow more Jews in to allow the richest ones, to give them a place where to stay that had no difference with the beautiful homes on the Grand Canal. Even the gate of the Ghetto Novissimo is different. It's large, it's monumental. It's almost a place, a piece of pride, so to say, a sort of a work of art. Can the gate of a ghetto become a work of art? as you can see, with limestone all around. But again, this is to break with the stereotype often we have that when we talk about uh, you know, the ghetto, then we think that it's a monoblock. In fact, it had uh, so much diversities inside, uh, within the community, depending on education, on social, on social class. What is the ghetto today? Well, I think that you, you would agree with me. If you, your family had been forced to live in the ghetto, would you live in the ghetto today? Um, no. 
So this is the place where I would say two or three families, uh, this is the front. So you see they had also servants' quarters up there. This family that lived here clearly was particularly, particularly wealthy with the mezzanine offices of their trading activity with storage rooms. Canal um, level. So this, the the idea of uh, a place which today has its uh, synagogues, has its um, activities, uh, has its uh, memorials, but paradoxically is not the place where Jewish people in Venice would uh, would live or or live. I hope I have not uh, taken too much of your time. This has been so wonderful, Lucella. Wow. Thank you for this incredible, incredible tour. So informative and just beautiful. Well, um, it's difficult for me in 45 minutes <laughs> to, to, to tell. I mean, usually it would take me five hours or to go around, but I, I, did my, I did my best. Well, that's okay. You're inviting everyone to come in person at some point, hopefully, right? And, uh, and, see it and see it live. Um, this, is, this has been fantastic. There are some questions. So um, I, I did get all your questions coming in. I'm going to you know, select a few of them. And uh, Donnie, if, I'm gonna open up the chat box now and folks sure. can put their questions in the chat. Um, so if, ever, if you could, if you, if you still have a question, please send it just to everyone or to Donnie, not to me, because I, I won't see it. I'm going to ask from the existing questions that I have. So, or I can also answer by email in a different moment. <laughs> right. And we would be happy um, if you're willing to share your, your contact information and uh, folks can know how yeah. to get in contact with you. Um, so the first question has to do with the relative quiet that people noticed. Um, pe folks were wondering, is it usually this quiet? Do people still live in all of these buildings um what so i mean uh, right now it's a weekday it's still vacation time so i suppose a lot of people are at work a lot of people are also at the beach i hope for them because <laughs> it's very hot and uh, it's yes uh, very quiet usually so we are not in st mark's square where lots of tourists are around Okay. And um, who lives there, generally speaking, now? Um, any anyone. Anyone, anyone that wants to live. Yeah. So th it's just a part of Venice, of course. So let's see. Um, how can I answer? Anyone. <laughs> so in the ghetto, there live uh, uh, people that just find the place uh, convenient. Uh, we have also a very active um, community, Chabad. But um, I don't know if they live in the ghetto. Actually, I know that they are active in the ghetto. Okay. And what's the current uh, Jewish population in Venice and maybe Italy uh, in general, if you know? So in Venice, I think uh, that it's uh, just uh, below 500. So it's quite small. Uh, consider also that before World War II, uh, the number of uh, Jews living in Italy was around uh, 47,000, so never a major, a major community. So not a large number, but also I think that um, we would need to check, but the numbers are connected to the ones that are part of the community, so officially part of the community. Someone had a question about the stumbling blocks that you had mentioned uh, about who put those in. Um, did the Jewish community put them in, the city council? No. Thank you for asking. This is a very important project. So we have, um, um, well, uh, in Venice, I would say, if you're interested, you should contact the IVESER, so Istituto Veneziano per la Resistenza, I-V-E-S-E-R as they are the ones uh, that can put you in contact with the ones that are actually um, collaborating with the artist, the Gunther Demnig, to place the stumbling blocks. Uh, you can also decide to adopt one if you live here, so to take care of it, to polish it. And um, they are placed here every year 
in January. Usually on the 27th of January, you have the major uh, Memorial Day. Uh, it's the time when the Russian troops uh, open the gates of Auschwitz. Uh, so that's uh, for Italy the day we remember. And Gunther Demnig used to come every year to place uh, the new Stolperstein. So little by little, the project goes on. Uh, right now, there are 70,000 all over, all over Europe. Wow. Um, thank you for explaining that. Um, I'm going to ask two more questions. And Dani, I, I have a feeling some more questions came sure. to the box, and then maybe you could ask those. Um, so first is, where are the cemeteries, the Jewish cemeteries? So the, so the community of Jews actually uh, moved for the first time permanently in Venice at the end of the 1300s, in 1382. Was then banished, but in between, in 1386, the Jewish community was given a graveyard, there were still is, and that's at the Lido Island near the Church of St. Nicholas. So facing the Adriatic Sea. At, at the time, the Lido is very busy. Next week, we have the film festival with international celebrities and stars, movie stars. But at that time, in 1386, nobody wanted to go to Lido. And that's where uh, the graveyard, or rather, that's where the grave uh, tombstones are for the old part. Uh, and then that's also where the modern cemetery is. Um, and last question from me, which is um, a few people have asked about what is possible to visit in person. Um, can you go into the synagogues? Um, what about the Museum of the Ghetto, which at some point was closed for renovations? Um, can you it's, let a, know? it's a still closed and uh, the only way to get updated information is to go on their website, the Jewish Museum. Uh, people will answer all your questions. I know some guides uh, that give a tour in the synagogues so they are <laughs> sometimes told from one day to the other what else they can show what they can no longer show it depends on the restoration work which still goes on so at the moment uh, i saw people exiting the um, ponentina synagogue the spanish a Portuguese one, which was surprising because I thought that's the synagogue right now used and in the past it was not allowed anyway. So they are trying their best to play by the ear and to offer as much as possible. At the moment, I know not all the synagogues are open for tours as they used to be still. Okay. But I don't know when the restoration work is over. You need to ask the Jewish Museum. Okay, thank you. And uh, Donnie, did uh, any more questions come in uh, before yeah. we wrap up here? Yeah, so uh, uh, thank you once again so much, Luisella. This has been fascinating for so everyone out here who's connected. Um, one of the questions, uh, you, you sp spoke about the diversity of wealth uh, in Venice, especially in the ghetto. And uh, the question is, were any of the wealthy Jews, did, um, did they only come from other parts and found safety in Venice? Or were there some families that actually grew their wealth within the ghetto through different businesses uh, and whatnot? So the, are you asking why people moved to the ghetto? Or? No, it's more of a question of did the wealthy families that lived in the ghetto, did they bring their wealth from other parts or did families actually grow their wealth within the ghetto? Ah, okay. No, I would say that this is a community which once uh, the gates were removed could eventually, was allowed eventually to invest the capital they had accumulated and took care of several monuments in the city. I'm uh, thinking uh, of how active the Jewish community was uh, during the time of the Habsburg domination fighting uh, for the liberation of, uh, of Venice and uh, also playing a major role in the finance, uh, in the legal, uh, in the banking system in the city. Um, but really, I think that um, once the gates were removed and the Jewish community left the gate, then it would become 
for them time to be more secular and therefore to in a way lose something but to become more venetian than the venetians so i'm sure that the capital that was accumulated that was eventually used also to take care of the cultural heritage in venice and also its economic life Got it. And I, I guess as a last question, maybe you can, um, you can recommend where people who, there might be people on this line who might have family that have come from or come through Venice. Um, particularly, uh, there was a, a possible uh, rabbi, Rabbi Altaras, um, that, uh, that, that one of the people on the line here might have a uh, connection to. Um, do you recommend reaching out to the Jewish Museum in Venice or where, where, where might be a good resource for people to learn about if they have any family that have uh, come from the ghetto? Good question. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if there is also, I would say contact uh, rather than the museum, the community and see what they can do. Um, we have uh, for sure people that can help in the archive and uh, in, uh, the, in the library. So I would say rather than the Jewish Museum, I would uh, contact the Jewish community. And I think that the contact is present in the website of the Jewish Museum.